both uh, honoured that so many of you are here and, both, and, and terrified. <laughs> For the first time in a number of years, I'm talking to actually a, a bunch of folks who actually know more about this industry than I do. Um, you're the real cutting edge, you're the pilots, you, uh, you fly the airplanes, um, and so I'm probably going to get some pretty hostile questions when I finish up with my address. But uh, I was just talking at our table, um, and as we have Peter Yates here from Cathay Pacific, it's a tale uh, that I'll start off with. Uh, it involves my father. And uh, back in the early 70s, uh, Cathay Pacific introduced their Marco Polo Club. Now, it wasn't the flashy card you get today with the frequent flyer program. Uh, what you got was a, um, a scroll which said, you know, E.L. Thomas is a member of the Marco Polo Club and extend all the courtesies and whatnot. And the real catch, or the real hook, I should say, was a tie. And uh, the salesman said to Dad, who was a very luxurious traveller, uh, was travelling in a suit and tie, he said, wear this Marco Polo tie and the, the, uh, the staff will be at your feet, you know, grovelling. That appealed to my father. So <laughs> Mum and Dad went to Hong Kong on Cathay on the on the uh, Convair 880, or it might have been 707 by that stage, and uh, Dad sitting in economy, as most of us did in those days, and uh, the steward walks down the plane and uh, Dad adjusts his tie and nothing much happens, you see. This is not, this is not, the, this is not the messaging. Um, and so the same thing happens again. Now, Dad's sitting on the aisle seat, so he thought, right, I'm not going to stand for this. And uh, as the steward walks down the, the aisle, Dad stands up and adjusts his Marco Polo tie. And the steward says to him, I see you wearing one of those crummy ties. <laughs> <laughs> so the messaging obviously hadn't drifted down to the, uh, the rank and file. <laughs> but look, uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to talk to you today about the F-35 um, and then the future of air travel. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about the F-35 and how good or bad it is. And, whether we've bought a lemon or not. It's quite an extraordinary story, actually. It's a bit like the F-111, which, interestingly enough, again, I'm talking to folks on my table. Uh, it was a story on the F-111 that I wrote um, back in 1968-9 um, that started my career in a, a, with writing you know, about aviation because what I saw were written in the paper was nonsense and the F-111 was an outstanding aeroplane and history proved that to be correct one of the best fighter bombers that have ever been built. Um, but anyway, let's get on to the F-35 and the future of air travel. But before we sort of get it delved into that, a lot of people ask me how I got into aviation. And I want to share a couple of light-hearted slides with you, if I may. Um, that's the first photograph taken of me uh, with an aeroplane. Um, <laughs> some of you will recognise that's Forest Place. Uh, the picture is colourised, as most of my photos are, by Benoit Vienne in Paris, a great French colourist who we use, we use extensively. Um, and uh, if any of you have got one of those Japanese tin toys in a mint condition box, I'll buy it off you for uh, $50 and I'll have it on eBay tomorrow morning for about $2,000. That's, <laughs> that's what they're worth. But uh, moving on from that, my father was in the import export business. Uh, imported stuff from overseas and came in packing crates, he used to bring them home. And we, as you can obviously see, that's obviously an aeroplane, uh, the wing and the, the engine, the propeller on the wing there. Um, and that's my sister there with my brother. And my sister was so inspired, she went, went on to become an answer there, hostess. Um, but looking at that, my brother's doing some wing walking there. <laughs> and you can see by the tail, uh, I was not an aerodynamicist because that thing was never going to fly, uh, far too small. So I moved on to something more aerodynamic, and that was uh, Superman. <laughs> and you see it's in black and white, and that was because in those days, Superman on television was in black and white. Uh, and this particular photograph actually has a tragic uh, twist to it because I, I wore this to the school dance, um, and... Uh, one of my colleagues in my class, his mother was more adventurous than mine and he had his uh, costume made out of colour fabric and they had a vote as to who was the best Superman and he obviously won. 
and I see him still today and I remind him of how traumatic effect that had on my life. <laughs> but as, uh, as, we will, as all the men would know in this room, uh, when it comes to your career path, there's obviously, there's always, I should say, a woman involved. And so it was with me. I went to New Zealand in 1968 with my, my parents, took us to New Zealand to a tour. And that's a photograph of us at uh, Coronet Peak. And I fell hopelessly in love with the girl on the, on the left there. Her name was Helen. Uh, you can just see me behind her. Um, and after the, I got back to Perth, I wrote to Air New Zealand and said, look, please send me a photograph of your aeroplane. I wanted to remember her and the trip to New Zealand. I had maps of New Zealand and all sorts of things on the wall. And they sent me this photograph of an Air New Zealand DC-8, which is what we flew on. And the, sh the long and the short of the story is that I forgot the girl and fell in love with the aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> more, more particularly, I fell in love with the man who designed it, Donald Douglas. Um, man in the middle. There he is talking to President Roosevelt, um, and this is in 1942. Um, he dominated aviation, as you all probably know, with the DC-3 through the 30s and 40s into the 50s. Um, and because of his dominance of aviation in the early 40s, President Roosevelt put him in charge of uh, wartime production of aircraft, and he was the one who pioneered the, the um, uh, aircraft companies building um, aircraft for each other. So in other words, Douglas built uh, B-17s, Lockheed built B-17s, etc., etc. Um, and an outstanding man whose mantra was, my word is my bond, which is how I've tried to fashion my life uh, since. Uh, the more you read about him, the more you love him. And, and in fact, because he was such an outstanding individual, he attracted, uh, that's DC-3 at Tableland Station, that's not a new Perth Airport Terminal. Uh, <laughs> he attracted to him some of the greatest designers in the world. Uh, in that photograph there, um, and I haven't got a pointer, so I'll try and point them out to you. That's Mr. Douglas there. That's Kindleberger, Lee Atwood. Those guys went on to form North American Aviation, B-25, the Mustang. The Mustang was rolled out 100 days after the British asked for it. Uh, an outstanding aeroplane, amazing aeroplane. And he brought together the greatest minds, aerodynamicists, Jack Northrop, uh, because they all wanted to work for Doug. And that was how Douglas Aircraft dominated aviation through the 40s, 50s and 60s um, and whatnot. So that's how I got involved in aviation. Uh, just a passion for Douglas and then a passion for aviation. So just a little sideline if you didn't mind. F-35, uh, extraordinary aeroplane. Um, I was saying to my colleagues here, um, I don't normally cover military aviation. I have. I, I was very much involved in the F-18 decision over 30 years ago, maybe even 40 years ago, whatever it was, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, I wrote extensively about that. I uh, said that was the aeroplane we needed for Australia rather than the F-16. But uh, I'm, I'm mainly focused on commercial aviation. So. Recently, I was talking to the RSL Highgate, and they said we want to talk, we want to uh, hear about the F-35. So I, I uh, uh, pulled together all the things that I knew about the airplane, and then I contacted some colleagues who are experts in this industry, uh, who uh, run uh, military aviation magazines, and uh, also some colleagues in the RAF, and said, you know, brief me on the F-35. So what I pulled together is a presentation based on all of that collective. Um, and, you know, the F-35, without any shadow of a doubt, is an outstanding aeroplane and it's great for Australia. The commander of Air Combat uh, Group, uh, Tim Olsop, said recently, to say that the F-35 performed wonderfully is an understatement. It is truly a generational and transformational capability for the Royal Australian Air Force throughout the exercise, and that was the one up in Darwin recently, JSF really came into its own. Um, the Joint Strike Fighter was, the fighter was initiated in the early 90s uh, to replace the F-16, the F-18, the Tornado, um, Warthog, Aviate uh, Harrier and others. And the first flight was in 2000. There was a Boeing versus Lockheed fly-off. I don't know whether you've ever seen a picture of the Boeing aeroplane, but it was never going to cut the mustard at all. It looked, it looked, it looked awful. Um, and so the winner was declared as, as a Lockheed airplane. 
uh, and there's three, there's three models, as we all know. That's a photograph of it with its external stores recently taken in Darwin. Um, and as you know, it, it either takes external stores, it takes a lot more, or it takes internal stores for a stealth type mission. Um, Australia has 72 F-35s to replace the F-18 uh, and they're all due to be delivered by the end of 23. Um, we have a requirement for 100 but it all depends on uh, what we do with Super Hornets. Um, all nations and services that have bought the um, F-35 have now have it as, as, as operational uh, and that includes NATO, UK, Japan, Israel and South Korea. Um, we now have 37 F-35s at Williamtown um, and 13 more due this year. That's another shot of it with the, uh, F with the F-18s. Um, now the, the beauty of this airplane um, is that it has obviously an air-to-air -air capability. It has the sh carrier short takeoff conventional capability. It has an air service, air service capability and then it has the intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capability, the electronic attack capability, and a command and control capability. So it's an amazing force multiplier, which is what Australia needs. We don't have a big air force compared to others, but this particular airplane gives us that force multiplier capability. Uh, in the stealth mode, it has several orders of magnitude uh, less than the F-16, F-18. It's only beaten by the B-22 or the F-22. In lay terms, it can get several times closer to a target, 30 nautical miles instead of 120 nautical miles, without being seen or detected. Um, and when adversary forces turn on the S-400 and future Chinese and Russian-made air defence systems, the F-35 shows up as the size of a mosquito. So you can see it, but you can't track it. Uh, too small to attack. Um, this is a Lockheed slide I know, but I've checked it with my colleagues um, in the defense, in defense industry, and it is correct. Um, air to air, six times more effective than a legacy airplane. Air to ground, eight times more effective. Intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, six times more effective. Acquisition cost is about the same, and operational uh, uh, cost <coughs> is uh, fractionally lower. So it ticks every single box as far as capability and cost is concerned. Recently, the red flag uh, performance, um, the airplane scored a 20 to 1 kill ratio um, and it flew 16 mil uh, simulated missions, offensive counter uh, air missions, eliminating 100 service to air missile sites without losing an airplane. Uh, basically, it's an unmatched capability, unmatched. Uh, that's a shot of it taken uh, at the red flag exercises. So, mission efficiency. Uh, a pair of F-35s can strike multiple targets in a contested environment with no support, save perhaps a tanker. Uh, to get two conventional fighter jets to similarly contest a target requires 10 to 20 additional airplanes. Um, so, you can see um, that any way you slice it and dice it, this airplane has incredible capability. Now, one of the, I'll stop this for a second. One of the issues here, why we're getting so much negative publicity, is because in America, they saw this, the politicians. And of course, we know when you mix politicians with aviation, it's a mess. Um, the politicians saw it as a low-cost replacement for the F-16 Falcon and the and a couple of other airplanes. Now the cost has risen because the capability has risen dramatically. Now while in America that may be a bit of an issue because they've got the F-15 Eagle, they've got the F-22 Raptor who have those some of those capabilities and they may be saying well why do we have this other airplane that has these capabilities? For us in Australia we don't have F-22s, we don't have F uh, F-15s. So the capability the F-35 is exactly what we need uh, and we're not, you know, the cost is not, is not outrageous uh, considering what the aeroplane can do. Shot of it there with uh, all the, um, all cleaned up. Um, so it has had some problems as all military aeroplanes do. Um, 
the manoeuvring restrictions the jet had are now removed. Um, the cost is basically the same as an F-18. It's, you know, it's all the same price. It's cheaper than a Eurofighter. Um, now, the only other issue is the game-changing helmet-mounted display system. Now, this helmet is pretty amazing because the airplane's got cameras all around it. And a pilot can be flying this airplane and look down. He doesn't see the joystick. He doesn't see his legs. He sees what's underneath the airplane. So 360-degree vision. 360-degree vision. This is what this airplane... Now, the only problem with this system, which doesn't actually affect us, is that there's a problem when it comes into land on, an, on, a, on a jet, at, uh, landing on an aircraft carrier at night. Um, and there's also some distortion with, when refueling, which of course you don't need. Just flip the thing off and you can do, the, do it visually. Um, so in a combat scenario, which is when you really need it, uh, there's not a problem. So again, it's one of these problems that, that's been overblown as far as, as far as Australia is concerned. Um, cost $17 billion for the project, uh, not just the 100 airplanes. That includes all the base infrastructure for Williamtown and Tyndall, uh, ground support equipment, uh, new comms network, initial weapons, sim, spares, support training. Uh, it doesn't include future software upgrades or sustainment or life cycle. Um, the aircraft unit cost is about $85 million US. Uh, by comparison, the Super Hornet is about the same, but you'll need to buy some other extra stuff so, you know, really um, comparing apples with apples is much the same as a Super Hornet uh, airplane. Problems do remain. Um, it's, it's, as I mentioned, it has, removed, it has moved from its original concept as a cheap replacement for the F-16s and the F-18s. That's an American problem. It's not our problem. Uh, there are 873 unresolved deficiencies, uh, including 13 Category 1 items. Um, and but according to the latest reports, most of those Cat 1 problems have been resolved or close to being resolved. So the political flack remains, and of course, this finds its way into various media who decide they want to have a crack at the government over one thing or another or, uh, or the whole process. So essentially, the airplane, any way you slice it and dice it is an outstanding aeroplane for Australia, particularly. Uh, it's, a ma it's an incredible force multiplier, which is what we, something we really, really need. So, any questions on the F-35 before I go on to the next part, or do you want to wait till the end for questions? Any questions on the F-35? Yes, sir. Apparently, a lot of the software that's still in development needs the input of intelligence from the outside source. Yes. And that's going to be a large addition cost. Look, indeed. I mean, it's not, it's not without its problems. There's no question it's not without its problems. But um, uh, a, a, a large number of the problems are really overblown uh, and don't take, uh, and, and a holistic view is not being taken of the airplane. Uh, but yes, you're, you're absolutely right. There are some uh, software intelligence issues to be resolved. Yeah. Yes, sir. Isn't one pilot a problem? There's so much to cope with. Wouldn't a two-man crew be better? Well, a, a one-man pilot in the F-18 works perfectly, although, of course, in, the, in some versions there's two pilots. But the, the, the sophistication of the software in this um, and, and what it will do, um, apparently, according to the, the, the RAF pilots I've spoken to, it's not a problem. They can handle it. Um, so. They say no. They say no. Yes, sir. I saw the F-35 coming to uh, uh, Avalon in 2017. The two of them arrived there, but they couldn't fly because there was thunderstorms in the area. Have they fixed the fuel tanks? Yes, they have been fixed. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, there's been all sorts of issues along the way uh, that have been rectified. Um, and, and most of the, as I mentioned, most of the Category, third, category 1 items are either being fixed or about to be fixed. So uh, operationally, uh, according to the RAF pilots that I have spoken to who fly the airplane, uh, they don't have any issues with it at all. Yes, was sir? weight ever an issue in the early Sorry? stages? Was weight ever an issue in the I early couldn't, stages? I think weight is always an issue with aeroplanes. Um, I couldn't 
specifically address that issue, um, except, except to say that weight is always an issue with aeroplanes and getting it out, because everybody says we want this bit and we want that bit and we want to add this and this, and, and so the weight goes up and up and up and they've got to have a, uh, an exercise to pull it all out again. Um, I don't think this aeroplane exists where weight has not been an issue in development. Um, uh, yes, it was an issue, absolutely, um, but uh, largely addressed, uh, my understanding is, largely addressed. Yes, sir. I um, understand that this aircraft's maximum Mach number is considerably lower than some of the uh, national observers. Well, yes, look, there has been some speculation, some speculation, there has been discussion, I should say, about the Mach number of, of the airplane. Uh, and yes, compared to some some Russian aircraft and, and, and possibly even Chinese aircraft, yes, um, they they uh, uh, there's a speed issue there. But at the same time, with the intelligence reconnaissance package in this airplane, uh, it can be argued that you know it, the the adversary can be seen well in advance and locked onto well in advance. Um, and missiles launched to, you know, dispatch it. I mean, we're getting into some very fine discussion about, you know, what we'd see in an air-to-air -air combat situation. Um, but yes, there, there has been some issues with the Mac numbers. Both in time. But getting back to your F-16 analogy, uh, F-16, that came out of the Vietnam War where the Phantom, uh, we, had a, we had a situation in the Vietnam War, and please, gentlemen, correct me if I'm not quite right here, um, where the, the rule of engagement was you had to see the enemy and identify it as a, as a North Vietnamese aircraft before you could fire on it. And of course that nullified the advantage of the Phantom with its Sparrow missiles. Um, so, and it didn't have a gun at the time. And therefore, and, that, and the F-16 came out of the Vietnam War where you had a very agile aeroplane. But one of the things about the F-16, and this is what I argued over 40 years ago, was the F-16, and it was touted by, by GE, GD at the time, the F-16 was great as long as it had an F-15 spline above it giving it radar cover because the F-16 radar wasn't that crash hot. Didn't, didn't, didn't see that far. F F-15 did. It's the same with the F-14, same thing. Long range radar. Now, so with, with the Australian Air Force, we, we don't have the luxury of having two or three different types of fighters. We just have to really say we, we, we buy the best one we can with the money we've got. So we bought the F-18, which was the right choice to make because it had a long-range radar um, and had, the, had that longer-range capability. Now, sure, coming forward to today, one could still argue the F-16 is a damn good aeroplane for a very, very close in tight context. Um, but it needs, it needs something more capable above it uh, that, gives, that gives that cover which is what the F-35 is. And yes, one could argue, one could argue that at the extremes of the fighter environment, from the long range, ultra long range, super fast environment to the short range, tight environment, it's in the middle. But that's, our, that's, that's all we can afford. I mean, it'd be great, for instance, if we could afford to buy 100 F-22 Raptors and 100 F-35s, it'd be great. But we can't afford that. So we've, we've got the F-35, um, and it's the best thing in, the best thing in the market. Um, it's certainly got its problems, um, but they are definitely being resolved. Um, in, 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 in my view, and, and the view of my colleagues who follow this industry very, very closely. So let me then just move on. And if you want to talk to me afterwards about it, I'm very, very happy. I want to just move on about the future of air travel. Um, and. Uh, uh, that was what air travel used to look like um, if you were on Virgin Australia. And uh, if you were travelling on Air Asia, and now I know why people travel on Air Asia, um, that's what it looked like. But now, that's what it looks like. <laughs> Not very attractive at all, is it? Um, and uh, there we are. This, this, this is air travel today. Um, PPE. Uh, everywhere, all sorts of restrictions. Um, now this is an Airbus uh, graphic. Uh, let me try and explain it to you. Um, essentially what it says 
uh, is that a full recovery um, of travel as we know it, or knew it, January 2020, as we knew travel, we're basically looking at January 2025 before air travel recovers totally free around the world, no masks, no nothing. That's another couple, two or three years. That's what Airbus forecasts. That's for a complete normalisation. Uh, so they expect the recovery to occur between 2023 and 2025. Okay? Not next year. As Qantas would have you believe. Um, the domestic markets have stabilised. International is basically still idle. Uh, now, some of you jump onto Flight Radar 24 and you'll see aeroplanes everywhere and say, well, that's rubbish. Well, those, most of those airplanes are flying with no passengers and just freight. So, you know, don't be distorted by the numbers you see. Uh, and then when the, 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 and the planes that are flying uh, with passengers would probably be about 20% full, maybe 30% full. So, uh, essentially, traffic is cut in half. 25 years of growth has been lost through COVID. This is a graphic showing you the oil crisis, the Gulf crisis, Asian crisis, the 9-11, <coughs> SARS. Remember when 9-11, everybody thought the world's falling apart, travel's dead, it's finished, it's kaput. Look at the little blip, just a tiny little blip. Look at COVID over here in the red. It dropped off a cliff, absolutely dropped off a cliff uh, when COVID hit um, in uh, March last year. <coughs> Now, most of you would think air freight, well, most air freight goes on 747 freighters. You're wrong. Most air freight does not go on 747 freighters. Yes, there's about 150 of them out there, and they do carry freight just like that. 40% of the world's trade by value, 40% of the world's trade by value goes by air. Okay? It's a huge amount that goes by air. 90% of it goes in the bellies of passenger planes. Okay? So when you take the passenger planes away, all of a sudden world trade is in an absolutely chaotic situation. And I was involved with the WA state government as a consultant last year, helping them uh, with uh, perishable cargo, um, a colleague and I. And we were chartering four, seven, eight, seven, tens from Singapore Airlines a week to carry 53 tonnes of Lily Valley pork to Singapore a week. That's, that's what was, that was what, they normally send that every week on passing on the four or five flights a day that Singapore Airlines would have. And now without those airplanes, we had to charter in these uh, four, seven, eight, seven, tens a week. Cathay Pacific, about 40 tonnes of crayfish a night, going to Hong Kong, uh, four nights a week. Um, and then the same thing with Qatar taking chilled pork to Doha, Emirates taking chilled pork, chilled, not pork, lamb, lamb. <laughs> <laughs> That's wrong. Chilled lamb. Chilled lamb, please, please forgive me. Chilled lamb to uh, Doha and, uh, and, uh, and Dubai. So, you know, a huge disrupt, massive disrupt to international trade. Um, this is a graphic showing you Singapore. The top line is um, what the traffic was like in 2019. You can see the other line is 2020. And then the green part there across there uh, is this year. Um, contrasting that is Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Atlanta is the biggest airport in the world. Um, and southwest of uh, the United States, southeast of the United States. Uh, you can see it has recovered. And that's largely because Americans have kind of just, you know, <coughs> a different approach to COVID to us. Um, that was the um, air traffic uh, prior to COVID uh, from Flight Radar 24. And that's uh, in April, one month later, you can see the traffic across the North Atlantic just fell in a hole uh, and it thinned out everywhere else. Um, what does it look like on the ground? Well, these are shots of Avalon, uh, Qantas. Uh, this is Victorville in uh, California. Any of you folks been to Victorville? It's a fantastic place. Lots of airplanes. Lots of airplanes. Um, Emirates uh, A380s in, uh, they've got about 70 A380s grounded at the moment in, uh, in Dubai. 
Um, this is Alice Springs, uh, planes everywhere. At the peak, there was about 9,000 airplanes grounded around the world uh, to do with COVID. Last year, the industry, this is a graphic, um, last year the industry lost 118 Point five billion US dollars. We were going to make, now I'll convert this to Australian dollars now. Um, we, the industry expected for 2020, it expected to make 50 billion Australian dollars. It lost 150 billion Australian dollars. That's a 200 billion dollar turnaround in profit. This year they expect to burn about 90 billion more. So it's pretty, pretty sick and savage. Um, air passenger volumes, as you can see, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it just dropped off a cliff, um, and it's slowly but slowly recovering. Uh, but the global economy itself is swinging back, which is a good news. Um, the the actual output of production is uh, is, uh, is is on the up and up and up. Um, but this graph is a bit complicated, but I'll simplify it by telling you that the the recovery is very varied around the world. Like China is about 80% back to what it was before. Uh, the United States is about 60%, Europe 60%. Australia at the moment, we're barely at 20. Um, that's domestic and international is negligible. So it's a very varied situation around the world. And that relates to the very many different perspectives on what uh, we do with COVID and what we don't do with COVID. Um, as far as a traveller is concerned, it's a bit of a complicated graph, but I'll try and simplify it by saying what the, in, what the airline industry has tried to do is to simplify the whole process of travelling. Uh, that's been complicated dramatically by governments who can't get their act together as far as what is going to be um, required and digitising what is required. That's another big issue, digitisation of certificates. So check-in is remote. When you get to the airport, you've got masks on. Even at Perth Airport, you've got to have a mask on. Um, and then in the uh, whole check-in process, again, distancing, masks. On board the airplane, as you folks would know, uh, airplane environment actually is very sterile with HERPA filters and uh, bringing in air from outside, mixing it, um, and uh, the air is recirculated about every three minutes or four. Um, and then when you get to your destination, again, distancing uh, and a complex process of arrivals. Um, the, comp the, the process of, of departure and arrivals is a real headache um, because they are saying at the moment you can add an extra hour each end of your flight to deal with the, um, the complications of documentation relating to COVID. Um, and that's going to be a major impediment to travel. Because people, when they, when they hear about problems, they're going to say, forget it, I'm not going to travel internationally. I just won't do it. Um, so they're going to have to resolve that issue, um, and, it's, and it's not being resolved anytime soon. Um, at Airline Ratings, which is an organisation that I run, we actually now COVID rate airlines. Um, we look at what they do, and this is Qatar Airways, seven-star rating uh, on our website. Um, there's, we just green, we have in green what they do, uh, and we give them a rating. Um, this is these shots were taken in Dubai um, of people being tested before they get on board, um, and, and that's the sort of thing that you might expect at some airports around the world. But, you know, there are, ma there are major advances being made uh, on new testing um, where you're going to have a COVID test and you get an answer within five or ten minutes. And it may well transpire that, you know, travelling through Perth Airport, say, next year when things open up, you may have to get a COVID test before you actually get inside the terminal. And they'll say, yes, you're clear, you're fine, OK, good, I can get inside the terminal. At least you will know that everybody who gets inside that terminal has got a vaccination and they've got a COVID test, so they're clear. And people who say, I'm not going to, you know, I don't need to get vaccinated, well, I can promise you, you will have to be vaccinated. That's all there is to it. Uh, and I would expect, from everything that I'm hearing, that you're going to have to get vaccinated to go to the football. You're going to have to get vaccinated to go to some restaurants. Because when they open up, which eventually we're going to open up, there are going to be, have to be all sorts of protections in place. Um, and I would imagine most governments, and it's happening all around the world already, they're demanding you be vaccinated. 
and that's all there is to it. And of course, most people in this room, most people in this room can put their hand on their shoulder and you can feel the smallpox scar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you remember when you travelled overseas in the 60s and 70s, you had a vaccination book on one hand and a passport on the other, and in that vaccination book you had seven vaccine stamps, small, smallpox, uh, typhoid, malaria, you had all sorts of things, and you simply couldn't travel without it. Um, so that's where we have to get to, um, and I think that the way forward out of this lockdown that we're in, the, well, we're borders closed, shut, locked, um, the sort of things that the government's going to put in place are going to be all sorts of restrictions related to whether you are vaccined, vaccinated or not. Uh, and that's all there is going to be. And it's the same with aviation. It, 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 aviation will lead the way in that space. Some airlines uh, are now giving you um, uh, kits to get when you get on board. Uh, there'll be masks, there'll be wipes, there'll be this, there'll be that. All sorts of care kit uh, for you, which is extraordinary. I mean, you two or three years ago to think that airlines would be giving you care kits for your health uh, from travelling was just like, you know, what you dream or what? But that's what happens. That's what's happening now. Um, and successful airlines are doing that and doing it very aggressively. Also, aircraft are, are, are clean, cleaned every night. This one's using UV, uh, ultraviolet light, <coughs> to uh, clean aircraft. It takes about 20 minutes. Um, it's like a, like a catering cart that moves through the aeroplane and sterilises everything. Aircraft. Um, so there you go. That's the future of air travel. It looks a bit grim, I must say, but um, I'm very, very happy to take any questions, particularly on the location of MH370. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Can we travel insurance? As soon as we get travel insurance, I'm off. Yes. Have you spoken to any companies? No, I don't, I don't think travel insurance companies want to know about it. I mean, you know what travel insurance is like, like any insurance. Uh, we'll insure you as long as there's no risk. Um, look, and to, but, to, but to be serious and to answer your question directly, there are airlines that are now saying, if you catch COVID on our airplane, we'll cover you. Emirates is one. So that, I think that'll be part of the suite of tools that airlines will say, OK, we're going to give you unlimited changes. We're going to give you two or three years extension on your booking. And we're going to insure you as well to get, to get you back on our airplane. Uh, so I think insurance would be part of your airline package going forward. Yes, sir. Um, Glasgow's coming up pretty soon. 2030 nations are saying they are going to reduce their carbon footprint. Right. I, do you know how <coughs> airlines are airlines ever going to cope with that? Well, look, you know, it's interesting. I, one of the, of all the things, of all the things that I do, of all the things that I've ever done in this industry, the thing I'm most proud of is I write with a guy called Guy Norris from Aviation Week and Space Technology based in LA, and we've been writing a book called Greener Wings, The Plain Simple Truth, all about airlines' true impact on the environment. And airlines have done an outstanding job in reducing their carbon footprint. Uh, we started this in 2008, um, and I could actually say to you, hand on heart, that if every industry of the world did what aviation has done, then we wouldn't have a problem with, with carbon footprint at all. And some of the, some of the uh, things that are happening are just extraordinary. Like the 787, for instance. The 787 burns 34% less fuel per passenger than an A380, therefore 34% less carbon. The A350 is about 40% less than an A380. So there's some amazing technologies coming through and people like Rolls-Royce and General Electric have got new engines that are going to bring that down way further as well. So I have no issue with, with the carbon footprint impact um, of, um, of, of the airline industry. Um, and we have led the world. Seriously, aviation has led the world. Now, people say in the media, the lay media, they say, oh, you're only interested in reducing carbon and fuel burn because the price of fuel is, is so high at that particular time. It's rubbish. Sure, that's a, that's a factor. But as you all know, one pound of fuel is a pound of payload you can't carry. So it's been the driving force of aviation since the first aeroplane took to the sky. 
reduce the fuel burn. Because if you reduce the fuel burn, you can increase the payload. So, um, you know, and the other thing too, which is really astonishing, you get all these people out there screaming blue murder about airplanes' carbon uh, footprint. But do they tick the box and offset their flight? No, nope. no, no. But the pickup on that is so low, and it's both so simple. You know, a flight to Sydney, what, five dollars, ten dollars to offset your carbon, your carbon impact. People don't. They, 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 they're very vocal about what we should be doing, but will they offset? No, they won't. So, look to answer your question seriously, aviation. We are a shining light of what technology can do to reduce carbon footprint. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Any comments on the claim that we're going to be powering these big airliners with hydrogen in the future? Yeah, look, Airbus is looking at that. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There, that's one of the technologies they're looking at. They're looking at an aeroplane by 2035 um, with, with hydrogen power. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Tragic crashes. So well, wasn't that the problem really? Larger engines making the aircraft sure. more stable. Look, no. Well, y yes and no. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But this is what's been happening in aviation for decades. Mm -hmm. So with Airbus, for instance, you've got a pilot uh, through software, which they're pioneered. The Airbus has done a great job with it. You've got an A319 captain can walk off and fly an A330, and all of this is juggled, juggled with software. It's been going on for generations. And and same with the triple seven. You've got the standard triple seven, you've got the GE ninety triple seven, you've got uh, the LR, you've got all these different versions. They all perform exactly the same way because of software adjustments. And yeah, this was a software adjustment, as there are many. And one of the things interesting things about um, uh, this I was talking to an Airbus captain. Now, he is an Airbus check and training captain in Singapore, at Airbus Singapore. And we're talking about this, and he's talking about the pilots that are coming through today. And he said, in our view, 10% of pilots that come through here can fully understand every system on our aeroplanes. The rest of them can't. Now, you know, we're talking about a different generation of pilots today. We're not talking about gentlemen like you. That sort of grew up through. No, it's it's one thing to to grow up through a system, and as things are added into, you understand it. Now, if the seven three seven Max is like a Ferrari. Sure, it's not a, it's not a triple seven. It's not a seven four seven. But the power to weight ratio, it's like a Ferrari. It's a very very powerful airplane, and you've got a guy flying it. He's got total hours in an airplane. Total 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 three fifty. Three fifty. You know, you sort of think yourself, you know, well, isn't that, it, shouldn't you add a zero to that? No, it's 350. That's it. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it, look, it's a watershed moment. It's a terrible, terrible tragedy. Yes, probably Boeing was arrogant. Airbus has been arrogant as well because behind the scenes, they've been making adjustments to their A320neo. Same issue, bigger engines, same airplane, and they've been making adjust software adjustments in the wake of the Boeing uh, disaster, they've been making adjustments to their airplane as well um, to correct it. So.